Welcome to Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Barbara Bell and I'm artistic director of the festival. I'm really pleased this evening to present Diner Cuisine, Tradition and Taste from the Catskills. I'd like to begin though by acknowledging that the land from which we're generating this online presentation is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these indigenous nations for their historical and ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All of those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring this re these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We're very grateful to the organizations and individuals who support the festival. Tonight, Kingston Writers Fest would especially like to thank the Embassy of the United States in Ottawa for the support of Sarah Franklin's appearance at the festival, and also Canada Council, Heritage Canada, Ontario Arts Council, the City of Kingston, and Kingston Arts Council. Also special thanks to Tourism Kingston for their marketing support, and thank you to all of those of you who have donated or supported the festival. And now just a few uh, little notes before we get started. The event is an hour long. It may stretch slightly over. We're in a kind of relaxed mode. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to um, ask questions of Sarah. Uh, and that's where you're gonna use the Zoom Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom uh, of, this, of the um, platform screen. You can tell us where you're joining us from, if you like, and you can post your questions there as well. Uh, please complete our online survey for a chance to win a pass to next year's festival or um, a swell basket of books. Uh, check our website for details on that. And we really hope you'll tune in this weekend to some of our other great events. Now here to say a few words on behalf of the Embassy of the United States in Ottawa is Cultural Affairs Officer, Susan Bridenstine. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, thank you, Barbara. Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Bridenstine. I'm the Cultural Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa. And while I'm really disappointed I can't join you in person tonight, I am delighted to join you virtually for what I believe will be a fantastic conversation with authors Sarah Franklin and Lindy Mashevsky, who doesn't love talking about food. In my work as a diplomat, I found that food is one of our deepest yet most accessible points of connection. To share a meal you have cooked or a family recipe is to share a piece of yourself. The late Anthony Bourdain said it well, food is everything we are. It's an expression of nation, our personal histories, our province, our region, our tribe, our grandmas. It's inseparable from all of those from the get go. For example, there is no greater evidence of my own Iowan heritage than my love of the great Midwestern staple, the pretzel salad. With not a lettuce leaf to be found, it contains butter, sugar, cream cheese, whipped topping, jello, strawberries, and of course, pretzels. Both the United States and Canada are filled with strange and wonderful foodways. Lindy and Sarah are perfectly positioned to dive into how the cuisine of the Catskills in Ontario evolved and influenced one another. Sarah's book gives us a slice of the Catskills through the life of the Phoenicia diner, while Lindy's own work dives deeply into Ontario's edible past. I will admit an ulterior motive to my being here tonight as I am a great lover and collector of cookbooks. One would think that in a career which involves hauling all of our worldly possessions across the globe every three years, that I would have learned to collect items that maybe lacked the bulk of 500 cookbooks. But if this group doesn't feel a kinship to my collecting, who will? <laughs> I assure you the Phoenicia Diner cookbook will soon have a place on my shelves. I'm excited that both Sarah and Lindy are here with us tonight to discuss where our food traditions connect and diverge. I imagine your mouths are watering for this discussion to begin. So I thank you once again for joining us this evening and I'll turn it back to Barbara. Thank you so much, Susan. And now we'll uh, turn to the event and I'm going to introduce Lindy first and then just turn the proceedings over to her. Many of us know Lindy Mishevsky as a local Kingston essay contributor and food writer. 
However, she is also one of the most recognized names in food writing in Canada with a large media following, both in traditional media and social media. Her books combine her enduring love of food and history, including Out of Old Ontario Kitchens, which won the Taste Canada Gold Medal for Culinary Narrative, and Sir John's Table, the culinary, uh, uh, also the culinary life and times of Canada's first prime minister, and that too won the, uh, uh, the gold medal. She's, she's also authored the cookbook, A Taste of Wintergreen. Her um, recent essay, Spotted Dick, combines her interests in food and gender and can be found in the anthology, Body and Soul, Stories for Skeptics and Seekers, which takes readers on a spiritual journey through the messiness of faith, practice, religion, and ceremony. And coming in 2021, much anticipated is Ontario Picnics, a century of dining outdoors. Lindy's writing never fails to educate and delight and her passion for the food of our past and the importance of our communally, communally shared food is very clear. Please welcome Lindy Mischewski. Hi, hello everybody and thank you Barbara for that lovely introduction, so generous of you. I'm absolutely thrilled to, to be here to welcome Sarah Franklin and I want to welcome everyone tuning in tonight and thank you all for spending your Friday evening with us. We might be in the middle of a pandemic, but literature and food, both on the menu tonight, are perhaps more topical than ever. So to Sarah Franklin. Sarah is a writer, journalist, oral historian and storyteller whose far-reaching interests include examining society through the lenses of food, memory, and oral history. She has a PhD in food studies from New York University, where she is also a part-time faculty member. Sarah is the author of the Phoenicia Diner Cookbook. And for those of you who haven't seen it yet, it is this beautiful, hefty hardcover that takes us on a literary, photographic, and food tour of the region of the Catskill Mountains that she lives in. Actually, she's from Kingston, Kingston South, we'll call it. Kingston, New York. Um, her book is full of recipes and Sarah's beautifully written stories, plus glorious photographs that tell stories all by themselves. It is one of those cookbooks that you will want to read your entire way through. Sarah is also the editor of a book called Edna Lewis, At the Table with an American Original and Time Permitting. Uh, I'd like to come back to Edna Lewis because Edna was such an incredible and remarkable woman, a black woman, a communist, uh, the granddaughter of an emancipated slave, and Edna broke through every barrier to achieve the most astonishing degree of success and recognition through both her cooking and later her food writing. Sarah has a new book in the works too, uh, Tastemaker, The Remarkable Life of Judith Jones. And I think Judith Jones is someone that if we don't know about, we probably ought to. I didn't, I have to admit, uh, but she's an, another extraordinary powerhouse woman who had a huge impact on the world of food writing, both as a food writer herself and the pioneering and legendary editor of some of the most famous American writers and food writers of all time, including Julia Child, James Beard, and one of my absolute favorite writers, MFK Fisher. So as I mentioned, Sarah lives in Kingston, New York with her husband and her twin, twin children who are turning four tomorrow. Uh, so if they're tuning in, happy birthday. Um, Sarah, thank you for joining us as we talk about the staggering and fundamental importance of food. And just before we get going, as Barbara mentioned, please feel free to join us, uh, send in your questions, all questions welcome. Um, we will get to this at the end of, before the end of the session and you can use the question and answer box at the bottom. Okay, Sarah, welcome. I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank and I'm going you. to, uh, we're, and we're, we're so glad to have you. As, as awkward and strange as it is communicating this way, we're so glad to have you. Um, and I, I wonder if you would mind just saying hello and then going straight to a reading from your phenomenal, phenomenal Phoenicia Diner cookbook. I would be delighted. I, I'm so glad to be spending this evening with everyone. I wish, of course, that I was in Kingston North as we had planned. And who knows, maybe next year we'll be having an Ontario picnic and we'll flip the script, Lindy, or something of that nature. And I think we're all going to be desperate to be together again whenever it's possible and, and eating together, certainly. Um, so 
Before I get too far, I, I just wanted to give a little bit of context, which is that I began writing this cookbook, which came out earlier this spring, when I had only lived in the Catskill Mountains for about a year. And so it was an opportunity for me to get to know my new home region um, through the best tool I know, which is being a researcher with an excuse to ask questions and, and be nosy, basically. And so it was this terrific tool, and I spent about two years working on it with my husband, who was then the chef at the Phoenicia Diner. Um, and it, it became this beautiful unfolding of getting to both learn the food ways of this region, but also getting to sort of poke into bookstores and libraries and rivers and talk to fisher folk and um, dairy farmers and all kinds of people. And so it became this, working on this book became a real passport for me and getting to know the place that I had come to live and raise my family. So I thought that I would begin by reading um, a little bit from the introduction just to sort of orient you to what it's like here. Uh, I'm about four hours south of Montreal, so I'm not terribly, terribly far away. And then a little bit about diners, since that's in large part what we're talking about tonight. So this is from the introduction. The directions are simple. Take exit 19 off the New York Thruway in Kingston, make a right turn onto Route 28 and head west. A simple sign on the right reads Catskill Park, a rough hewn outline of the region etched into the wood. To the right, a dilapidated steakhouse sits on the edge of a rock face. To the left, a low slung motel. Past the dollhouse, a once rickety building of peaks and eaves now renovated. Habitat for humanity's restore parking lot is full to capacity, as always. People dropping off entire estates worth of furniture and bric-a-brac and tourists and locals looking to snap up a deal. The motorcycle club on your left bumps up against a warehouse for unfinished wooden furniture. Across the road, a kombucha shop and a strip mall, an indicator of changing tastes in this region. Continue west and deep front porches invite you into house after house, imposing stacks of firewood always prepared to stave off damp rain and the long winter alongside rockers and vintage gliders ready for lazy summer days. To the left, through the pines, a glimpse of the vast bowl of the Ashokan Reservoir, a man-made wonder that quenches the unending thirst of New York City. A white arrow on a, green sign, on a green road sign announces that Woodstock is just a few miles off to the right. The hills rise up ahead, the crisscross of peak against peak casting long shadows. Signs of the city slip away. You're in the Catskills now. A few miles farther, a towering sign that reads simply diner rises up on your left. On a post shorter in stature, there's an artist's rendering of an old school Woody, the iconic American station wagon loaded down with outdoor wreck equipment, an inner tube, a canoe, skis, a nod to the long history of this road, this place moving people toward leisure, toward a haven. Pull in and the parking lot is full. Chrome edged motorcycles and beat up pickup trucks, spotless sports cars and aging station wagons packed to the gills. People come and go, chatting over coffee under the tin roof of a simple wooden pavilion where ceiling fans twirl, twirl lazily. Inside, it's the picture of a classic diner. Chrome and tile, swivel stools at the counter, leather booths, paper placemats. A chalkboard announces the day's specials, and a felt letterboard above the long Formica counter advertises milkshakes, cookies, and a kid's menu. Everyone is welcome here. The kitchen hums, churning out diner standards, fried eggs, pancakes, burgers, and the like, alongside the unexpected. A skillet of soft scrambled eggs studded with smoked trout and creme fraiche, a fried catfish sandwich topped with a fish sauced slaw, cider braised duck over creamy grits. There's pie and pudding for dessert. At tables, longtime local residents sit side by side with Brooklyn hipsters up for the weekend. Hunters sit next to vegans and renowned musicians rub elbows with farmers. The clink of forks against ceramic and the sound of plates being scraped clean mingle with the laughter and rock and roll. No nonsense servers offer more coffee. It is every diner you've ever known, but the view of the mountain ridge from the plate glass front wall and the cues on the menu, the prominence of trout, the local ramps, syrup and cider, and a bagel with lox and cream cheese, a nod to this region's tourist past, are firm reminders that you're here. This is the Phoenicia Diner. And so just a little note, I won't read long over here, but, but I did wanna talk about diners for just a second to orient us a little bit towards the food. So I'm just gonna read a little from um, what we call the mission statement of this book. Diners have always been bastions of democracy and approachability in the ever-changing restaurant industry. They are the places where anyone can find something they will want to eat. 
Diners are the same everywhere and yet each is distinct. They're recognizable by their booths and counter seating, their endless coffee refills and menu items like eggs anyway, pancakes and classic American sandwiches. But some may have a Greek twist to their menus, sneaking in spanakopita and gyros, while others lean American Jewish with blintzes and knishes. They're known for their no-nonsense food and sometimes salty service. From the writings of John Steinbeck to the paintings of Edward Hopper and the films of Woody Allen, in small towns and along well-traveled routes across the country, diners are an iconic, essential part of the American landscape. They're also disappearing. One need only walk the streets of New York City's five boroughs or drive along the main streets of small towns to see diners shutting their doors, losing business to faceless chain restaurants or fancy coffee shops. While such establishments may follow national trends in consumer spending and dining, they tend not to fulfill the yen for local character, the sense of community and belonging, the comforting fare that diners have always offered. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Thank you, brilliant. Um, and it, actually, I, had two, I have two questions that have come up like that I, that I wanted to ask you and, and you've raised both of them here. And, and one of them is that, um, and I, I'll, I'll start with my sort of my second question actually, which was that I had noticed that you, that line about diners have always been bastions of democracy mm -hmm. and also that diners are disappearing. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of jumped to that conclusion that, okay, is democracy disappearing? <laughs> is this a, a statement about democracy disappearing? Well, I mean, this is a very loaded question for an American right now in this period of time, I will say, but, um, you know, I think there's a way in which democracy in, the, in our food culture globally is, is simultaneously having a tremendous revival because lots and lots of people are opening food related businesses without going through culinary school, without necessarily formally training and finding ways to open that require less capital for startups. So be that a food truck, um, or selling out of a window somewhere, particularly in this moment since COVID has begun, people are really reinventing what the notion of a restaurant or food service even is. And I think that's really exciting. I, I think that's a kick in the pants for the food industry that I, I really believe is, is long overdue that sort of corrects the ultra fine dining movement and the mm -hmm. tasting menu. Um, and this, this notion of food is performative, which certainly some people love and it can be lovely for a treat, but I don't think it reflects the way people actually want to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and certainly it's not the way most people can afford to eat. But in terms of diners and democracy, you know, I think in the US, there is a, there's, a, there's a real truth to walking into a diner to the extent that they still exist and, and getting very quickly a sense of who lives in a place based on the little tweaks on a menu. So there, there's this kind of standard diner fare that you expect to see everywhere and one would be really surprised if they weren't able to find a grilled cheese sandwich, for example, or maybe chicken noodle soup. But you always see this inflection of flair based upon the culture of the chefs or the people in the kitchen. And that's as true at the Phoenicia diner as it is anywhere else. The Phoenicia diner, many of the cooks come from the Pueblo region of Mexico and so our food has that inflection, has that flavor laced in all over the place. And it's, it's one of the things we hear a lot about. It's quite unexpected in upstate New York because we actually don't have a large Mexican population. It's not a particularly visible population up where we live, but it's a population that supports the restaurant industry in our part of the country. And so that cooking makes its way into the kitchen. It makes its way into staff meal, and then it sort of slowly finds its way onto the menu. And so I think there's a way in which you kind of always see who's actually in a place by who's cooking in diners. Interesting. Yeah, and I, I feel like the access to food, the, the concept of access to food and democracy are so linked. And so the point That's you make there is, is really interesting, and especially about, you know, Mexicans who have such a phenomenal food culture and, and how they're sort of spreading throughout, you know, the US and also Canada, and we're seeing more and more Mexican food, which is, a, I think, an amazing thing for us. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, I mean, that's, I, what I wanted to, my first question that I wanted to ask you, and I, I skipped ahead to that democracy, because you brought up that wonderful line, diners have always been bastions of democracy. And, it, and I, it made me think of so many things, like it made me wonder, do we have that in Canada? I don't think we have diners to the same extent in Canada. I don't think we've ever had the diner culture. Uh, you know, in, in a small way we have it. I just don't know what actually, I mean, we certainly have, you know, coffee shops, but mm -hmm. what actually replaces the diner here? I'm, I'm uncertain and maybe audience members can weigh in on, in, in on that question. 
in the questions and answer section and, and tell us what you, you know, what you think of when you think of a diner, a Canadian diner. But, but I wanted to backtrack and actually ask you how you came about your role as writer of the Phoenicia Diner Cookbook and maybe even back up a bit further and tell us how you came to food writing in the first place. Ooh, the second part is a big question. So I'm gonna table that just for a moment. But, but how I came to this particular project, I was finishing up a dissertation, which I was getting rather bored with. It was starting to feel dry and I was stuck in books and papers and I wasn't getting out into the world very much. And I missed that, I missed that um, going out and interviewing people, which is the thing I love most about being an oral historian and a journalist and, and a food writer, because you get to go out and talk before you have to sit down by yourself and do the hard work of writing. Um, and so my husband and I had been planning for a, quite a long time to leave New York City, where we had both lived for a long time before we lived here. And I had sort of set the clock that um, if and when I got pregnant, that I was going to say, we're going, whether you're ready or not. And so lo and behold, I found myself pregnant with twins. And um, this is four and a half, a little more than four and a half years ago now. And we had been for years kind of plotting places on the map um, where we might end up. And we had all sorts of criteria as young idealistic people want to do and sort of think that they have control over their lives. And so we had, we had narrowed our choices down to three different places and the Hudson Valley where we now live was one of them. And part of the reason was because on our first date, actually, we had come hiking in Phoenicia, New York. And we had been really hungry. It was January and um, it was my husband's birthday and we'd gone on a snowy hike, which of course leaves you totally ravenous. And the only place we could find to eat was the Phoenicia Diner. We'd never heard a thing about it. You're up in a region that essentially has no cell service. So you're not doing this sort of elaborate search comparing the menus of places. You go to the place that's open and you know we wanted a bowl of soup and something warm to drink. And we pulled up into the parking lot and it was a Saturday afternoon in January and it was packed. It was just packed in a way that suggested to us that something was going on at this place because we were really in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we were in the mountains on a snowy day and my impression was people were either out enjoying the snow or they were home, you know, with their ready with their salt and their shovels or drinking hot chocolate or, or whatever. But this diner was absolutely packed and we went inside and we sat at the counter, which I believe is really the, the best way to experience a diner always. You kind of, then you can talk to the servers, you get to sit next to strangers, you get a sense of what's going on. And we, we very quickly got a sense that, that this particular corner of the Catskill Mountains was really becoming this kind of nexus of change in New York State, which was, it was beginning to draw people who had been really pr aggressively priced out of New York City and Brooklyn in particular. So people that tended towards creative professions, but it had also managed to hang on to people who had landed in this region in the 50s and 60s when it was a real, um, sort of stomping ground for musicians and hippies and back to the landers and that there were long 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 timers here who whose grandparents and great grandparents had grown up here without any sort of glory and who were frankly having a really hard time finding ways to survive economically as things had begun to change up here so we were completely fascinated and uh so three four four years later when um, we were really ready to leave and the diner was hiring a chef, I remember my husband held up the phone and all I saw was the icon of that station wagon with all the outdoor gear on top. And he didn't say anything. And I said, you got to go for it. I mean, this is like our first date was there. This is the, this is the kismet or whatever. And so we did and he got the job and fast forward a few months and we had moved up. And I remember saying to the diner's owner very, very quickly after we moved up, he came over for dinner one night and we were sitting outside. It was beautiful high summer in the Catskills and as usual a bear had come down the mountain into our backyard of the, of the house that we were renting and knocked over the grill after we cooked which was a nightly occurrence and our dog had gone charging off after the bear there was this total drama every night and I loved it and I said you know Mike you've got a really good story on your hands with this place it's telling the story of what's happening to this region right now and it's literally spelled out on your menu and you have the opportunity to capture that in this in a beautiful cookbook I could see it right away and so I, I sort of pitched the story to him and I was, I had, I'd kind of written it in my head already. And then of course I had the wonderful trump card of having my husband on the hook as the chef ready. So I was like, well, look, I've got my whole team, you know, like we're ready to go. Just, just say yes and I'll make it happen. And so it did. And, and one of the things that was so interesting is while we were quietly planning to begin working on this cookbook and writing a proposal, an editor that I had known about but didn't know personally sent um, my agent a, an email 
and said, you know, I know that Sarah's up now and she's somehow connected to the diner and I've just been hired at Clarkson Potter, which here in the US is, is one of the um, really forerunners in, in cookbook publishing and we want the book. And um, so I invited her up to eat and it turned out that she had grown up in Kingston, New York. And what made it even more interesting to me is that she grew up in a restaurant family who were all Chinese refugees and had cooked when Kingston was a kind of growing, changing city that was watching all these people come up from New York City. We then had a very large IBM campus. And so there was this real simpatico feel of we together as an editorial team, as a writing team, were sort of telling the story of the changes of the state of this region in this really fascinating kind of patched together, quilted together way editorially from a business standpoint, from a writer's and historian standpoint, and also from my husband from the culinary standpoint. So that's my long winded answer of how it all began. And then we were just off to the races. It was, I, I really feel like this boat, book kind of wrote itself. It was so, um, it was so obvious that, that we could pull from all these places and that the photography would be beautiful because this region is beautiful. Um, and so here we are. Fantastic. I love that synchronicity. It's, uh, had you, like, I just want to know, did, did you ever aspire, though, to be a food writer earlier? Oh, like, yes. Did, you did? Oh, yes. yes. Okay, so when did that begin for you? I remember so clearly, I, uh, you know, paper checks have all but disappeared now, but I, re I remember very vividly that when I opened my first bank account, as a young girl, my parents must have helped open it for me, I got my first checkbook, and I remember using my very first check to send off for a subscription of Gourmet Magazine. And it was a magazine that was never in my home. My mother was a really reluctant cook. She was a working mom and she kind of didn't care. She just wanted dinner on the table and it was bland and fast and my dad worked even longer hours. So food was boring for me growing up, but I loved to eat. And I, you know, I grew up in the era of the Food Network coming about. And so I had sort of squirreled myself away after school watching food TV and had, had become totally engrossed in the world of, of chefs and of live cooking and, and what it's like to narrate the process of cooking something. And so, you know, I had seen Gourmet Magazine at the checkout line at, when I went food shopping with my parents. And I just had always liked the look of it. It seemed like this kind of beautiful, luxurious escape. And this was the, this was the era of Gourmet Magazine when Ruth Reichel was at the helm and it was sort of at the top of its game in terms of both being beautiful and luxurious, but also they were attracting the best writers in the world to work for them, and many of whom were not food writers by trade. They were novelists and journalists and poets, but she would go find them and say, well, why don't you go off to such and such a place and write a piece for me? Because she understood that good write, food writing at its core is just good writing. Food is the lens or food is the subject, but the writing has to be good. The storytelling has to be good. And I, I remember very, very vividly saying to my brother, maybe five or six years after that, we were, he was then in university and I was not yet. And we were talking about what he was gonna maybe be when he grew up. And at some point he turned to me and said, well, what about you? And I said, well, I sort of laughed and I said, I don't admit this to anyone because it seems so pie in the sky, but I wanna write for Gourmet Magazine. Mm -hmm. I wanna write about food and get to travel all over the world and, and write stories about food. And I remember saying it to him and it was a wintry, snowy day. It's one of those things that I will always kind of remember as a video playing before me. Um, so it was something I always wanted to do. It was something I always thought was completely impossible, especially when Gourmet Magazine folded in 2008. I was like, well, there goes the dream, right? It's over. Who am I gonna write for now? But, but you know, the industry is changing, other opportunities come, the web has changed food writing, of course, and expanded outlets in some ways. And um, so yes, I have aspired to do this for a very, very long time. It's interesting to me that when you aspired to do it, you, if you were sort of, you know, confidential about it or private about it, because I had a very similar experience. And, and when I was 14, uh, my high school English teacher asked me what I wanted to do. And, I, and he, he said, you know, just go wild. Like, what would you do if you could do absolutely anything? And I said, I'd be a restaurant reviewer. Like, but it felt ridiculous. It felt it extreme. I had the same experience. And, and it felt so sort of braggadocious. And, you know, that it was, you know, I might as well have said I wanted to be an astronaut or, you know, a rock star. But I, and I never, but I never really left it behind. I never really left the idea. And I think now, of course, um, you know, it took me a long time to come back to food writing. I, I had a career sort of aside from this, I had a career in scientific editing, but I always wanted to write. I always loved writing. I loved literature. I loved great books. I, you know, and I read all the food writers and I just thought this is incredible. I mean, to have this, uh, and I agree with you entirely that 
that uh, food writing, good food writing is just good writing, period. And I'd like to see it evolve that way. I have some questions coming up about that further on, but I, I, I'm, I'm sort of still interested. I think that we have this great opportunity here tonight because it's so rare that we have an American writer and a Canadian writer in the room together like this. And I, I want to talk about foods that define identity. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was reading your book, one thing struck me over and over again. <laughs> it's such a funny thing because it, I mean, it's so common for you that you probably don't even notice this. And I know you, you know, you probably traveled in Canada and so you, you know this, but we don't eat grits. Like grits to us are the liberal party and people who vote liberal, we vote for grits, we don't eat them. Um, and and, and I, I looked it up because there's so many recipes in your book for various forms of grits. And I thought, well, I gotta try some of these recipes, but finding grits is really, really difficult in Canada. Like proper grits are really, you know, you can find cornmeal and, you can find coarsely ground cornmeal, but you cannot find grits the way you do in the States. And I'm not even clear that I like them because to be <laughs> honest, I mean, they're so uh, sort of alien to our culture. But it's so interesting that this narrow band of land divides us and grits stay south, you know, <laughs> and, and they don't come north at all. So I want you to tell us a little bit about grits and why they're so important and, you know, how like it seems like they're quite mainstream as well. No, so I would disagree with that actually. So grits okay. came to the Phoenicia diner with my husband who is a southerner. And you know, if you know nothing about the United States, one, one thing many people do know is that the North and South of the United States culturally are worlds apart. They really always have been, they, they remain that way in terms of climate, culture, politics. They're, that is changing and it's changing rapidly, particularly in big cities in the American South. But, you know, you're talking about, when you talk about the American South, you're talking about a region that has a close to four season growing season. So agriculturally, it is entirely different than the place where I grew up, which was in New York, and my family was all from New England. So much more similar to Canada in terms of, uh, Eastern Canada specifically in terms of climate than to the American South. But I ended up marrying a person who grew up in this land where, you know, they see maybe a quarter inch of snow a year and, you know, the, the summer stretches on for six months and it was alien to me. They were growing all kinds of things there that I really had very little familiarity with. Things like okra, things like grits, um, and, and kind of with the longevity of those high summer foods that was just really alien to me. So grits are not common in the Northeast at all. If you find them anywhere, you find them in Southern restaurants. And often in the US, when people talk about South and they talk about food, what they are often, what that sort of gets encapsulated by is soul food, which of course has a racial connotation here. So you're talking about cuisine that came up during the great migration with black people from the rural South to the industrial North and Midwest. And so that was really when you had the arrival of Brits in the North at all in the Midwest. So we're talking really about the early mid 20th century, not particularly long ago. And many people who have had grits in the North have the feeling that perhaps you had Lindy and that I used to have, which is that they're kind of gross and bland, but that it's like a corn version of bad oatmeal or cream of wheat. And you know, what, we're, what you're talking about there, and there's a, there's a little bit in the book about that, is instant grits, right? And so if you think about food in general, anything that gets so watered down, so industrialized, that you have an instant version of it, is generally going to be close to tasteless. It's not going to taste like the thing that it came from or was originally intended to be. And so when Chris, my husband, makes grits, he insists on using stone ground grits from corn that has grown really well on good soil with good seed, and that just tastes like corn. So in the way that almost every culture in the world has a porridge base that sort of sits at it as a foundation of its cuisine. So really, if you sort of stop for a moment and think about any culture in the world, you'll have something starchy that stuff gets put on top of that creates a kind of very cheap and accessible cuisine, a filling cuisine where dollars can be stretched. And in the American South, that is grits. In other, in, there are certain corners of the US where that might be rice, and once you get farther north, that turns into bread because we have more of a wheat culture. So we have a much more bread-based culture in the South has a much more grits and corn-based culture. Um, but really good grits just taste like the most delicious kind of golden popped corn in sort of luscious, creamy form. And they become this beautiful basis for all kinds of things. And one of their, one of their um, kind of gifts culinarily is that they work equally well for sweet and savory treatments, which I think is maybe not so unusual for that kind of um, basic starchy foundation, that porridge thing. Uh, but because so many of us have, have grown up in an era where that, that thing, that, that 
porridge-like thing tends to be industrialized, we don't think of it as the flavorful thing. We think of it as the base of maybe something else that tastes good, and then you might kind of eat the topping off the top and leave the rest. But good grits are not like that. You want to spoon them up. You want to really eat them on their own. Okay, so what's the texture? Well, so good fresh grits should be like, um, I'm trying to think of something pretty universal to compare Are they them. chewy? Are they meaty? Are they no, like no, they're certainly not chewy. If they're chewy, you've done something terribly, terribly wrong. So um, they, they are almost like a warm pudding, a fresh pudding, but with a little bit of like a granular texture, something toothsome mixed in. But because grits are always cooked in, they're always cooked in water, but usually if there's the money about, at least half of the liquid that they're cooked in is whole milk. And sometimes cheese is added as well. So they can range from fairly, um, fairly fluid, like it would maybe fall off your spoon if you picked it up and let it drip to almost viscous in texture because you've melted cheese mixed in. Um, but you want that, that sort of pudding silkiness is the thing you're always aspiring to when you cook it, grits, and thus you have to whisk them constantly when you cook. You cannot ever step away from the stove when you're cooking grits. And how long does it take yeah. to cook a pan of grits? Well, if you talk to someone who's from a grits cooking region, they'll usually talk about soaking them overnight first because they're probably a very pragmatic cook who does this every morning and would prefer not to get up at five if they could get up at 5.30 or six instead. Um, but you're looking at about an hour from start to finish because it's a, it's a dehydrated grain that has to take up all this liquid. So anyone who's ever cooked risotto is probably very familiar with this, right? You cannot step away. You have to keep adding liquid and you have to stand by the stove so that you, you continue to encourage the grain to take up all that liquid as it warms and cooks. Interesting. I just find this really interesting. And so were they adopted, like, you know, uh, your husband starts bringing these recipes and there's so many of them in the book. Were they adopted by the locals willingly? Totally. Because I oh. think the thing that the thing that really seamlessly linked Chris's cooking to this region's cooking is that the Catskill Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains where he grew up and also where he learned to cook are not particularly far apart culturally. So we talk about this deep divide between the North and South, but generally people are talking about the coast. The mountain cultures are actually quite similar in the way that mountain people in general, the world over actually have a lot in common culturally, right? They tend to deal with very lean periods in terms of food in the winters. They tend mm -hmm. to live in very remote places. So you're gonna be looking at staple items and fresh produce from a personal garden rather than things that you could maybe get from a shop in a port city or a more urban place. And so I think that that idea of grits, which is very similar to the idea of oatmeal, something warm and hearty that you might have to start off your day or after a hard morning's work before you go out again to do more work in the afternoon, sort of instantly resonated with the folks that already lived in this region, particularly the kind of hunting and farming community. But for people coming up traveling from New York City, right, you're talking about a global palate at this point. So for those folks, it's not, you could stick anything on a menu and they're ready, right? They're totally ready. The, the real test is whether the locals up here are willing to sort of not snub their nose and say, well, what is that? You know, and there are a few recipes in this book where that certainly happened, but Gritz was not one of them. He stretched their palate for them, right? This is an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about uh, culinary history and intergenerational food memories. Um, for me, this is really important and so overlooked. I, um, my own experience is that I, I spent time with my, uh, my grandfather in the north of England in Yorkshire when I was quite young. Mm -hmm. uh, and he taught me how to cook and he started teaching me to cook when I was three years old and I was doing these little tasks like helping him shell peas and I, he bought, he had me a little, um, a little wooden rolling pin, and a little tart pan. And so I would, you know, he'd make the pastry and I'd roll out um, pastry for jam tarts and he had me kneading bread. And for me, like I, I realize the older I get, the more I realize how incredibly influential that was and how it impacted my entire life. Um, it's just kind of the, I think I equate this, you know, food and love very closely because of this experience I had with my grandfather. But I, I mean, I, I think that we all have uh, some memories of, of aunts or uncles or grandfathers or grandmothers, mothers teaching us how to cook. And um, 
and it makes a big impact. I mean, you talked earlier about your mother not being a very good cook, but it could have been a driving factor in, in, in some of your learning to uh, overcome that and your, you know, your interest in it. But I want to talk about intergener intergenerational food memories in, in general and how important they are. And I wonder if you can, if you can add something to that for me. Yeah. If you can talk about I mean, I think they're tremendously important. And part of the reason I think that is because they're often not recorded. And most of their two, I see two reasons for that. And this is where I'll put on my scholar's hat for just a moment. But, you know, when, when you're talking about food, you're talking about something ephemeral. So it, it gets cooked, it gets put on a plate, it gets eaten and it disappears, right? So for, for the sort of pointy headed among us who are interested in um, the things that stay, so monuments and architecture and um, landscape and things that feel like they abide, food is really the opposite of that. And so for a very, very long time, and really until very, very recently, people that consider themselves real writers or real historians have completely ignored food as worthy of attention because it sits in this very uncomfortable place of ephemerality. It's, it's something that goes away. It is totally sensory, which again, those sort of fact and concrete oriented people. And of course, we, we in, the, in the Western world tend to live in a culture that's oriented that way, right? We like fact. We, we don't particularly care historically for things that are more bodily, more sensory. And so food sits in that uncomfortable space for us. And so therefore it's very provocative. And, and it's really difficult for the academy and for journalists and historians to kind of square how you deal with food when it keeps disappearing and recipes keep changing, they get somewhere and then they change through whoever, whoever cooks them. It's a very frustrating experience for people who are looking for something that kind of lasts in a different way. But of course, recipes do last. They just evolve with every cook whose hands they pass through. And that to me is what makes them so interesting because they are these sort of living archives of the people that handle them. And of course the people that eat them too because we have very strong, as you mentioned, taste memories. So often we remember the first things that we helped to cook, but, but very, very often people have very strong memories of some of the first things they ate and who prepared them and where they were, right? It evokes all this kind of sensory memory that then cascades. And then I think the other reason that, that we culturally, and I'm going to lump Canada in with the U.S. here because I think in terms of literature, we, there's actually quite a lot in common, is it's women's stuff. And, you know, it belongs to the world of community cookbooks and church suppers and women taking care of other women soon after childbirth or when someone's on their deathbed. And that is the stuff that has long been ignored as worthy of serious attention when it comes to history in particular. And I think generally when things get ignored by history, they tend to get ignored by the whole sort of nonfiction world. Um, and, and so cookbooks, in my mind, have this very sneaky way, starting around the 1950s, of kind of coming from a different direction and sort of saying, no, this actually is terribly important. We all eat, we all cook, or someone cooks for us, but we're all eating three or more times a day if we're, of course, lucky enough, the other side of that being hunger, which is also terribly important as a cultural driver. And, you know, there are fascinating stories around this. And, and it's a really interesting way to kind of get people to open up and talk about their families and the place that they're from and tension within a family or a culture politics. Of course, all that shows up in food. And so I think of cookbooks as this really subversive tool that gets people to kind of open up and relax to receiving messages about culture and history that they may not otherwise be willing to receive. I, I think of this as something I call the quiet power of cookbooks because they present something that is palatable, right? They, they find a way into your mind through your mouth, through your hands in the kitchen. Um, and, and it just sort of catches you off guard often what you've taken in literally that might be of a culture that you think yourself opposed to or you think yourself not understanding. So, you know, I think when you talk about intergenerational food memories, cookbooks are just sort of a contemporary form of catching up on that or catching some of that. They don't replace it, but, but there are ways of sort of acknowledging that this has always been a way that culture moves and has passed and that getting it down into writing is one way of saying it matters. Absolutely. That, and, and I mean, I actually have so much to say on this topic. I, the problem is not, you know, is, is to limit what I have to say. But um, <laughs> I, I think that the, the, there's, incredible, there's an incredible proud history of, of female food writers. And the, the kind of irony is that they, that was the only avenue that early female writers were able to work in, really to publish in. Um, there were there's a few exceptions to that but for the most part if you wanted to publish as a woman in the early days of publishing you were going to publish a food book a cookbook 
-hmm. And, um, you know, those cookbooks, like, you know, you think of Mrs. Beaton and, and even the people before her, Hannah Glass and the people before her, those cookbooks sold prodigious numbers. And they kept the publishing industry afloat and so that, so that men could publish fiction, essentially. But the women were kind of, you know, the, the, driving, the driving force and the money makers. And, and certainly they weren't, I mean, they were lucky to get their names on the books kind of thing. But right. um, I think, you know, we, we really overlooked, like they gave us this phenomenal uh, source of primary history just a phenomenal source of history that we wouldn't have if those books hadn't been written. And cookbooks continue to do that. And, and so that's another overlooked thing about them. And I mean, I don't know if this is like, this is, um, for me, one of the things that I, I find interesting is that, you know, we still have, at least in Canada, there's still these connotations to food writers and, and particularly to cookbook writers that it's sort of a less than. Yeah. To the, to the fact where, you know, the Canada Council for the Arts, which is a phenomenal organization and supports all kinds of Canadian literature, but they actually lump cookbooks in with um, the category calendars, agendas, almanacs, and cookbooks. They all belong together wow. in the books that do not qualify for funding from the Canada Council. Wow. So one of my um, desires in life is uh, to... To work, to work on that, to, you know, to, to lobby against that and to, to see cookbooks recognized for, and, and, you know, I think we're heading, we talked about this sort of earlier before in the green room before we talked about how your book is this kind of incredible, it's phenomenal, for anybody that hasn't seen it, by the way, I'm going to hold it up here. I don't know if that works, but um, this is this, this book is a hefty hardcover, first of all, it's beautiful. And it's this mix of story and recipe and photographs and you know, I just feel like this is the way cookbooks are evolving to, to include story and to be, you know, sort of really well written, uh, as well as giving us um, some food for thought and, and, and recipes as well. But I, this, is, this is what I want to see happen with, with Canadian food writing. And I just find it, you know, fascinating that we're still fighting for, um, you know, status as, as writers and, as, um, and, and for funding. So... Um, kind of an interesting little aside, but I do think that that, that you know uh, early food writers, early female food writers, paved the way, and and we've you know we've we've scarcely given them their due. Like it's, we're just beginning to give them their due. Yeah, and, and, and I, was gonna say, uh, I, I was going to say I I still don't think when people think of cookbooks, they they immediately sort of shut off the literary part of their brain. I think it's it's almost a reflex. It's like oh that as you said it it fits in with manuals, and that's an old yeah. notion of what a cookbook is, right? Um, and and yeah, it sort of belies this incredible art that goes into the production and the writing and the research and the teamwork, because most cookbooks these days are written by teams. They are not written by a single person. So most really good cookbooks are, are written by a team of at least two, if not like three or four or five people. Um, maybe one or two of whose experience is the culinary experience, right? You're, you're bringing mm -hmm. into the fold this creative team that, that has really um, training in storytelling or in history. But as you're mentioning, the, the visual is hugely important. And I think that's partly because of the time we're living in where we're all really attuned towards image, but also because no one is going to stay up at night reading a cookbook that's a manual, right? And, and publishers right. understand that for a cookbook to sell, it has to have some appeal other than its recipes working. And so that means it has to look pretty, it has to be fun to read, it has to be well-written, it should be informative, but it has to have these other elements that are gonna compel someone to purchase the thing. Otherwise they would go online and get a recipe for free. Right, which is what we do anyway, but we still want cookbooks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I want to have you touch very briefly on the book that you're working on currently that is about, that I, I think it's about to be released or it's, it's headed for oh, publication. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, but I want you to talk very briefly about that and also your former book. I want you to introduce these two women to our lives because they're both powerhouse women that, you know, aren't necessarily in the frame of reference in Canada, but but, but should be, maybe. Yeah, so these two women, um, Enna Lewis and Judith Jones, are, are connected to one another, which is an important part of my story and how I came to work on them. But, but Judith Jones, um, who is most famously known for two things. One, she pulled the diary of Anne Frank out of the slush pile when she was living in Paris in 1950. It had been soundly rejected across English language publishers 
all over the place, um, including Doubleday, who she was then a secretary for. And she, it was the first um, opportunity. She was 26 years old at the time. She went to her boss and sort of um, pulled, you know, out of her rank a little bit and said, we have to publish this. You're crazy to throw this away. This is, uh, this is the voice that's going to unlock an understanding of the Holocaust for the world. And of course she was right. Um, and she gets, she gets very little credit for that in the record because she wasn't the editor or the publisher, but it's a very well-worn story in American publishing now that it was she who made the case for it and sort of started the ball rolling. Um, and the other thing she's best known for is discovering and first publishing Julia Child. So she was properly Julia Child editor and very, and similarly, Julia Child, who was then working with Louise Bertol and Simone Beck, who were both French, had also been rejected all over the place. People said this book is much too big. Anyone who's ever held uh, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, it's a big, thick, dense cookbook. And, and the quote that always sticks in my mind that came from one American publisher was, American women do not want to know this much about French cooking. And of course, history has proved them terribly wrong. And they're, you know, I'm sure still feeling a little like this whenever that story comes up in print or in public. But she then went on after the success of Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and she was still a very young woman at the time working at Knopf, which is considered one of the most prestigious American publishing houses. She then sort of had this feeling, well, if we can do this with French cooking, there's an appetite to do it with other cultures and cuisines. And she was, of course, right. And, and the way she went about it, which ties together with my feelings about Gourmet Magazine when I was a young woman, was she went out and found people who were doing interesting things in the world. They weren't necessarily cooks or chefs, but they might have a dinner party that she had been invited to, or she might have met someone's husband or cousin or aunt, and she would find her way towards these people, most of whom were women, many of whom were not white, many of whom were born abroad, and she would start encouraging them to write down their recipes and their stories. And one of the reasons um, that her books are so good is that often they took close to a decade to actually come to fruition. So they began with letter writing and conversation, having meals together, maybe cooking a meal together, and that might lead to jotting a few things down. And then maybe a few years later, a book proposal would come in, and then maybe a few years after that, a book would be published. And so part of the reason I think um, that, that the publishing world is less inclined to publish books that way these days is it takes an enormous amount of time. And we have a very impatient publishing industry now, which doesn't necessarily want to give that kind of time to writers or editorial teams to put a book together. But Judith Jones is responsible for sort of what a lot of people would consider the golden era of cookbooks in English. Um, and many of those books then were translated back into languages of their authors, the native tongue of their authors. So people like Claudia Rodin come to mind, Mater Jaffrey, uh, Marcella Hazan. So people that have become iconically associated with the cuisine that they publish books about, really. And these are books that have never gone out of print um, and probably will never go out of print because they're considered the best in terms of walking people through a particular culture and cuisine. Um, that's not to say that there's not something to build upon in any of those given cuisines or something more granular. There's always more story to tell, but they're really considered the foundational cookbooks uh, in the English language. So the book I'm working on now is a biography of her that's infused with a lot of um, conversation and my own reflections because I was lucky enough to spend about a year interviewing her when she had just retired at the age of 88 after more than 50 years at Knopf. So it was this really remarkable moment in her life where for the first time she stepped away from you know working 80 hours a week and was really reflecting back on her life and being a pioneering woman in publishing she was also um, a phenomenally successful literature editor so cookbooks were one thing she did it's what she's best known for but she was also john updike's lifelong editor um, in terms of canada margaret laurence was her author right from the jump she bought the american rights to all those novels and many many award-winning poets as well so she has this she was always thinking of cookbooks as literature because she edited both at the same time, right? She treated them both with the same seriousness and rigor. So Edna Lewis was one of these people that she met out in the world. She met at a dinner party that Edna Lewis had catered. And Edna Lewis was many, many years Judith Jones's senior. She was born in 1916 in Freetown, Virginia, which was a town, you could hardly call it a town. It was a community of houses that had been settled uh, by formerly enslaved people right after emancipation, which in the U.S. was in 1865. And Anna Lewis was the grandchild of, of one of those couples who had settled in the community and was really attempting self-sufficiency outside 
of capitalism. They were trying to grow all their own food, educate their own children, and to the, to the extent possible, live without the need for depending on white people, which is where money was going to come from if they were going to get it, because access to jobs and land was just not to be had. Um, and so she's this tremendous, tremendous figure in American cooking. She was one of the first women to become a partner in a restaurant. This was in 1949 in New York City, um, and she was both chef and partner at the time, and incredibly well-known people were walking in and out of that restaurant. Truman Capote, Tennessee Williams, Eleanor Roosevelt, Jackie Robinson. It was this meeting of the kind of um, bohemian minds in New York City, and then went on to have a more domestic period in her life where she left the restaurant industry for a while, and then really reemerged as a caterer later in her life, which is when Judith Jones met her. And it was one of these stories where Judith Jones um, met Enda Lewis, who was at the time finishing up a cookbook that she was writing with a woman who was not a writer. And that cookbook ended up not being particularly good. It's called the Enda Lewis Cookbook, and it came out in 1972. But her second book, which she worked on with Judith Jones over the course of the four years in between the publication of those two books, was called The Taste of Country Cooking. And it's this remarkably beautiful, elegiac, memoir and history filled book that talks about the place where Edna Lewis grew up, which was this farming community that was that was run by intergenerational families who were attempting self sufficiency and living completely off the land cooking on wood stoves. But then also through the lens of someone who had cooked in restaurants right so you have these sort of multiple layers of filters that she had this cosmopolitan New York experience and this very practiced hand at cooking but that her formative years were in the country, in the American South, as a black woman, as someone who had communist leanings. And so talk about subversive ways to get ideas into people's minds and hearts and mouths that they might not otherwise be open to. This is one of those books. Um, and she was for a long time quite forgotten until very, very recently actually in American culture when there's been this huge resurgence around her memory and importance as one of the most important American food writers. Uh, many people think, and I'm certainly one of them of all time. Fantastic story. Just an incredible, she had an incredible life. Yeah, and actually, she worked on, on Franklin Roosevelt's campaign, didn't she? As, like, I mean, she had yeah. remarkable life. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, you think she was, you know, the granddaughter of, a, of an emancipated slave. It's quite fantastic to see this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And with almost no formal education, she didn't make it past eighth grade in the little town where she grew up. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're getting close to time and we've got some audience questions. So maybe I will have a look at those questions and pose those to you. Um, let's have a look here. Okay, so we're going to start with a question from Margie. It might be a statement. Let me just read this here. From what you've said, your book is as much a story as it is a cookbook. My mother trained as a librarian and her passion was cookbooks. By the time she died, she had thousands of them. But she didn't cook from very many of them. She read them. In a world where people go to the internet for the recipes, do you think the future of cookbook lies with food stories rather than recipes? Absolutely, yeah. And absolutely, Margie. And this was something Lindy and I were chatting about a little before we began. Um, I think cookbooks, if they're going to continue to sell at all, have to find other ways to draw people to them. And because recipes have so become so readily available for free via the internet, story is the way they're going to attract readership. They really, I think this is this moment where their, their possibility as a form of literature and as um, sort of griots for various cultures is, is being demanded because the recipe element of cookbooks is in some ways becoming irrelevant in this online age. Um, so though a publisher will tell you, you your recipes have to work, right? You cannot have a faulty recipe. They get very, very upset, your editor does. If you have a recipe that does not work, you better believe they hear about it. They understand that the future, the present and future of cookbooks is in good storytelling. Excellent. Um, a, a statement from Paul, this is fantastic, a, a thank you Paul, who says Chinese restaurants very much in every small town in Canada. That was obviously in response to our question about diners. Yeah. I mean, there are diners in Canada for sure. I just don't know that we labeled them that way, you know, and, and so they weren't, it's, it's pretty clear when it's the Phoenicia diner that it's a diner, um, but a lot of small town restaurants in Canada are essentially diners. Yeah, you know, yeah. The name. But, the, you know, I, I also think that is starting to die off a little bit as well. Um, so thanks for that, Paul. That's, uh, that's smart. 
Um, and he also asked, how do you think the loss of the diner shares the same, uh, sorry, how do you think the loss of the diner shares the same story as the loss of other community and small town assets like mm -hmm. churches, newspapers? Brilliant point, yeah. Can I answer that? Do you want to answer that for us? Um, it's a really good question. And I, I'm not going to um, pretend to have the expertise nor the time to really go fall all the way down that rabbit hole. But, you know, I think that to walk into a small town diner, if you're a local, you have to be ready to talk with your neighbors face to face. You have to be ready to deal with the gossip and maybe the chip on the shoulder and um, the question about the peeling paint on your house or, you know, you, there's a way in which it is just another meeting place like churches, certainly, or the post office for that matter. And these are the kinds of places we see more and more people avoiding en masse. And there's, there's also real counter movement to that. Lots of people are saying we have to hold on to these things, right? They're sort of, they're the last uh, remaining symbols of our, of our humanity. But we know that people are living more and more online. They're ordering food off of phones to their homes. This is true even where I live, which is a fairly rural area, that, that you see people staying in more than they go out or sort of choosing the people they interact with more than having sort of odd random conversations with their neighbors. So I believe that that's a part of it. I think there's a, there's a willingness and an agility to, to just be a neighbor and a community member that perhaps we're getting out of practice with. And certainly the younger generation, I see this, I'm a teacher of, of students who are not that much younger than me, but the, the difference in comfort with face-to-face -face conversation is dramatic. And so I would say that there's, there's a connection there. Um, and yet what, what's also happening at the same time is the longing for connection is stronger than ever, right? So we're getting less practice with the tools that allow us to have it. And also we're wanting it more than ever because we're feeling lonely, I think. And, and of course, in the last six, seven months with COVID, this has become so abundantly clear because people are meeting like this from their living rooms or offices and it doesn't satisfy us in the same way. So I think, I think all of those things are really connected. And it is a, it's a dramatic loss. I mean, we're not going to replace all this with Facebook and, and social no, media. No, of course not. Of course it's not. something we're going to actually have to work at as, as communities to, to replace. Yeah. It makes me want to open a community diner. <laughs> um, so Barbara has actually asked if I would hold up a couple of images from the book. And I'm, I'm going to hold up my favorite to begin with. I hope, I hope you can see this. So does that show up on, can you? Can you see that? I can see it. Okay, perfect. So hopefully that's showing up. So this is uh, in the Phoenicia Diner, and this is obviously one of the wait staff. And I think Sarah can tell me a little bit more about this woman. But I just absolutely love this picture. I mean, yeah, the she's a veteran. She has been there since before the current owner owned the restaurant, and she's in her 60s. And my gosh, do these women work hard? I mean, you can see from the number of plates on her arms, right? Talk about arts that are dying is servers mm -hmm. who can carry like that and do it all day long. And of course, in that picture, the restaurant is empty because we were shooting photos, but usually it's packed and she's dodging people. And it's an incredible skill to just sort of be a fly on the wall and watch a busy diner hum is incredible. Yeah, and I think that just the, the ability to interact with anybody, right, anybody, truck driver, a politician, a doctor, a local, whatever, you know, anybody at all, children. Yes. Um, this is one that I loved. I don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but I, love, I just, when I first opened the book, I saw this picture and, and it, my guess about this is that this uh, thing we see down here is clearing snow on the tracks. Is that correct, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, so obviously the Catskill Mountains and- Yeah, I mean, the road that the diner is on is in a river valley in the mountains. So, you know, when it snows, it becomes impassable, but it's a very important road because it's one of the few that connects the East and Western Catskills and it's a really important trucking route. It reminds me when you say that. It reminds me. Did you read the Laura Ingalls Wilder's books when you were when you were young? Yeah, of course. The the, the long winter and when the yeah. the train can't get through to Dakota yeah. and they have no supplies. I mean, that was just incredible. I, I think that was one of the earliest food books I ever read because I always consider it. Mm -hmm. to, she just talks endlessly about food. Um, here's another picture. This is inside the diner. And they're not all black and white, and there's a lot of food pictures. Um, I mean, I have to say the photography in this book is phenomenal. So it really is, you know, I mean, um, 
and, and also the little sketches all the way through and your head notes, which are fantastic. So the, 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 the little notes at the beginning of every recipe and the sort of, and the stories that are written in between. I, I had hoped we might have time for one of those little stories, but I think we're kind of running out of time and I want to get to everybody's questions first. Um, so somebody asks, Anne asks, are grits like polenta? Yeah, we, you know, we have these, we have these questions about, about grits. <laughs> Well, thankfully, you can get the mail here. order. I will say, for those of you who are curious, I would recommend, and we recommend it in the book, so I'm not going rogue here, but Anson Mills is a really, really phenomenal company based out of South Carolina who are vertically integrated. So they work with local farmers and they own some of their own land and they, they grow and save their own seed and then they grind, dry and grind their own corn for grits. So um, if you're looking to experiment, I would say start with something really high quality because otherwise you're going to be disappointed and you're going to give up. So you can get these things on the internet and they will be shipped to you and you must keep them in the freezer because like any good product, they are perishable. They're full of fresh oils and they will taste terrible. They come shipped to you with freezer packs for a reason. You have to keep them in the freezer. Are they like polenta? If, if you're someone who has had an experience of really soft polenta, fresh polenta that's literally poured from a pan onto a plate, then yes, they are essentially the exact same thing. Um, and again, you're talking about essentially a peasant cuisine that was derived from needing to stretch dollars. So it became the filling thing that you might put some vegetables and a little bit of meat on, um, or you might put eggs on or, or fish or anything that can sort of give it a little more oomph, but that's the thing that's gonna fill you up. So yes, a lot like polenta. If you're someone who's had sort of the fussy little circles of polenta that are more um, crumbly and dry, more akin to cornbread, no, grits are nothing like that. So they're, they're a spoon food, if that helps. They are not a fork food and they are not a finger food, they are a spoon food. I, I wanna hold up a picture of, of it's because it's a polenta picture. I think we deserve a polenta picture here. <laughs> this is baked polenta. Actually, this is very, very topical right now because it's with kale and pumpkin. So a yeah, seasoned a fall pumpkin. Fall dish. Yep. And it's, it's very, that's a super cheap one to make. It's things that you can find at any kind of market, things that aren't super perishable except for the grits. <laughs> I have this one marked to try. So there are, there are multiple marked to try. Yeah. Um, and I, okay, so what else do we have here? Uh, what is the single most used ingredient in Appalachian cooking? And how did people manage to increase its variety and versatility and cook with it? Um, gosh, that's a, there are a few things that I would put in that category and corn is one of them. And grits, of course, being a common application, but not the only one. So you'd also have hominy, which is a, um, a dried whole kernel corn and it's been nishtamalized, which means it's been soaked in um, lye to release a particular protein. So that links the American South to Mexico, which was where the process of nishtamalization was invented. And that's something that eventually made its way into the American South. So corn is the staple starch, certainly, of the American South. And you see it everywhere, sweet, savory, every meal of the day. Um, any sort of garden vegetable, particularly beans, so both fresh and dry beans, when you're talking about Appalachia, you're, you're gonna see beans constantly. They're canned, they are dried, they're eaten fresh throughout the long summer and into the fall because they're fairly frost resistant um, and they pickle beautifully. So that's something that stuck around. And I would say the other biggest piece, and this is also what links indigenous cultures of Appalachia to the white settlers, particularly from Scotland and Ireland that, that moved into the mountains from the coast, is pork um, because pigs did phenomenally well on the steep mountain slopes of Appalachia where farming was very difficult. Cattle did not do well, sheep did not do well, um, and goats didn't provide as much meat, but pigs did really, really well. So, so pig and pork in all its iterations, everything you can think of from a fresh pork chop, which of course would be a sort of very special prime cut that you might get once a year to smoked hams, bacon, little, little bits of smoked meat that you might mix into a pot of greens for flavoring, um, sausages of various kinds, things that will keep for a long time. So those are the three pillars when you're talking about Appalachian South is corn, beans, and pork. Interesting. And I, as you were describing uh, pigs in the hills and in, in the mountains, it reminded me of Spain where the pigs roam yep. free and then, and then they produce that, you know, the Iberico, yep. The, you know, the premier ham in the Right, world. and of course the other thing that I didn't mention is lard, right? So what pigs also do is they provide your cooking fat for you, which is so important. So any home cook in Appalachian, this is still true, my mother-in-law is this way, 
but you have a jar at the back of your stove where you pour off the bacon fat and that becomes your cooking grease. And um, of course carries with it all kinds of flavor and people will, there's sort of a lore around that. But that's the other reason that pigs are really important is they're very fatty animal. And so you get that cooking fat when butter is very scarce and very, very expensive. Perfect, wonderful. I do the same thing, of course. I hope everybody saves their bacon fat. <laughs> do you want to, do you have a short reading prepared? Like do you have a, a, a can you finish this off? Mm -hmm. with a the one I had chosen is not super short, so I don't know that it's the right one for this moment, but let's see if I can sort of fly by the seat of my pants here. I, what about um, page 178, 179, which is fly fishing and, and the fate of the, is it the sure. esophagus? The Asopus. Asopus, yeah. right. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and if, it, if we come to time, we'll sort of end this way, perhaps. But um, I love this essay because it's, what it's really about is the place that, that we're in. So this is called Fly Fishing and the Fate of the Asopus Creek. The year was 1955, and her name was Old Bess. It was April 29th, and the weather, weather was verging on warm, but the wind howled and the rain came down in torrents in Phoenicia, New York. Larry Decker stood in the Asopus Creek, waiting, waiting. Suddenly, he had her on the end of the line. Commotion erupted, people arrived by car and foot crowding around Decker. When finally he held her, mouth agape, her glory was evident to all those who had come. At nine and a half pounds and 30 and three quarter inches long, she was the largest brown trout ever caught in the Asopus. Record setting makes for a good story, but trout fishing has been a workaday part of Catskill's life since long before European settlers made their way to the region. In Sullivan County, the Lenape Indians developed a way to attract the area's abundant trout using the bark of a walnut tree, a trick that effectively lured the fish to their demise. Due northeast in Ulster County, the Algonquin tribe made their home along one of the main tributaries carrying water from the streams of the Catskills down to the Hudson River. When the Dutch came to the region in the early 1600s, they named the creek Asopus, which was their mangled version of the Algonquin name for small brook, and the name stuck. In the early 19th century, European settlers pushed deep into the dense hemlock forests of the Catskill Hills and discovered the riches of the mountain streams. Early Hudson River School painters began carrying rods with them on their wilderness adventures, delighted by the bushels of brook trout they were able to catch. By 1830, Shandaken, New York became home to Milo Barber, the first known fisherman's boarding house in America. Our region's famed nature writer, John Burroughs wrote, the water of all this Catskills region is the best in the world. Trout streams gurgled about my family tree. As the use of the area's brooks for sport grew, so did the fight for seclusion and wilderness resources. In the 1880s, New York State passed the Club Corporation Law, which enabled sporting groups to buy up stretches of river frontage for private use, which while exclusive, helped keep the streams uncrowded. The Great Trout War was waged as wealthy anglers hired game wardens to guard their river mileage against poachers. But at the turn of the century, when the Catskills region was tapped as part of the watershed for the rapidly growing New York City, the area's fishing culture nearly ended for good. In 1906, construction of the Ashokan Reservoir began, signaling a major threat to the winding tributaries and the fish of the eastern Catskills. Meanwhile, the rise in sporting tourism had brought about overhunting, including the near extinction of turkeys, the disappearance of deer west of the Hudson by 1875, and the necessity of trout restocking in the area's streams and creeks in the 1870s. The wilderness shrank alongside the area's wildlife. By the 1880s, less than 25% of New York State was forested. Today, that figure has risen to 63%. The nascent fishing clubs came together in resistance. On January 13th, 1923, the Kingston Daily Freeman announced the formation of Phoenicia Fish and Game Incorporated, an organization whose intent was to, to, excuse me, to sustain and preserve fish and game. They counted the fishing legend Ray Smith, a fly tying innovator who led expeditions for the New York City branch of Abercrombie and Fitch and guided the likes of Fred Allen and Babe Ruth among their own. The glue that held them together was a fierce devotion to protecting the wild character and lifestyle of the Catskills. As more rivers were dammed in order to help quench New York City's seemingly insatiable thirst, the Asopus was bombarded with muddy silt-laden water, with fluctuations in temperature and volume, and with new warmer water fish species. The clubs rose up in protest, winning a series of victories to regulate water flow into the region's waterways. In the 1970s and 80s, as the environmental movement in the United States gained ground, the group won two major battles against the state, one in favor of incremental water shutoffs and another against a pumped storage project proposed by the New York Power Authority. 
Ashokan Reservoir, Ashoka means place of fish, still a major water supplier for New York City, has become a hub of recreation. A footpath crosses the stunning basin, water cupped in the bowl of the hills, and the reservoir has become a major fisher, fishing destination in its own right, annually stocked with brown trout to supplement the brown and rainbow trout that move between the Ashokan and the upper Asopus in their annual spawning migration. In large part, it was the love of trout that saved this area's living waterways from ruin. Wonderful, beautiful reading. And, and it's, it's still fished, obviously. Oh, completely, yeah. And in a, in a growing way again. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I think uh, that's, that's, we've answered all the audience questions. I think we're probably, uh, we can call that a wrap. That's a wonderful way to end with that beautiful reading, which paints such a great picture of the area. It's Thank beautiful. You. I invite you all down when the border reopens. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here and say thank you so much, Sarah and Lindy. That has just been so enlightening, so enjoyable. Um, I just uh, ate up every word, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> uh, I want to remind you all that Sarah's book, The Phoenicia Diner Cookbook, and Lindy's books are available for purchase here through our local independent bookstore, Novel Idea, or certainly for through your own independent bookstore. Um, thank you, Novel Idea. Thank you to Penguin Random House. Thank you to the US Embassy in Ottawa. And thanks to all of you for joining us and for supporting Kingston Writers Fest. Uh, I want to let you know too, uh, to join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, as we are presenting Sarah Franklin in an event called The Importance of Oral Histories, which is another subject dear to her heart. So be sure to register for that and for our other wonderful author events uh, for the rest of the weekend. So thanks again, all. Cheers. Stay safe and well. And good, good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, for, you. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Sarah, Barbara, and everybody for joining in.